My name is Margaret Nasha, of course. I grew up uh, in Soweto. You know, when we were, grew- we were young as children, there was a system of giving away a child to a bigger sister or an aunt or somebody to go and help bring up the kids. I was uh, brought up in that sort of thing by my sister, who was based in South Africa, and I was there until I came back to Bichwana land uh, to start school. Now, probably I could have started school in South Africa if it were not for introduction of uh, uh, the system of black education, which was considered to be not that good. So I came back. I started school when I was nine years old. And in the year that I started school, my father died. So really, to a large extent, I was brought up by my mother, a single mother for all those years, uh, instilled in my head, although she didn't go to school herself, she did instill in my head that I should go to school. I started having career opportunities or thinking about career opportunities when I was doing a junior certificate. Uh, I, I wanted to be a nurse. In fact, I applied to a nursing school in uh, Zimbabwe or Rhodesia those days. They had a very good a nursing school there, which I wanted to attend. But my mother insisted that I should uh, proceed uh, with my with my education. So, yes, I did proceed. I ended up completing my Cambridge and going for university education at the University of Botswana here. Uh, after that, I joined Radio Botswana, as an announcer producer, spent many years there, grew up there, trained a lot in broadcasting. I was producer uh, of um, uh, international programs, some, you know, at some point, women, sometime. You know, we were jacks of all trades in those days. It is when I was in broadcasting now, after coming back from university that I started uh, developing this interest in politics because I also produced a program uh, from interviewing members of parliament. I developed a lot of friendship with many of those MPs of the day. Koma, and so on and so forth. Those days, and and they became really my mentors, so to speak. I felt very comfortable working with those old men, and I said to myself, maybe, just maybe, one day I should join politics. A moment in history uh, when I did think that women should be in leadership positions started long before I joined politics. I was a member of the UNESCO Commission in Botswana uh, with both the late Meman Teta. And when I was director of information and broadcasting, um, we worked a lot to ensure that women got the necessary education, necessary training, and exposure in different work situations, especially in my area. I was determined. And we, I was part of those, uh, the early stages of the women's movement here in Botswana, even when I was still a civil servant, because uh, we had an organization that encouraged women in the civil service to work hard, hand in hand, with men, never doubt their abilities, and ensure that uh, they can compete fairly 
yeah, with the men. Because as you can imagine, even in broadcasting, even today, it's a very difficult uh, area. Uh, there's a lot of competition there with a lot of men who, with whom you have to compete. I then decided to go into politics. Uh, that was uh, eventually in 1993 when I came back from the diplomatic service. The question that people always ask is, when you got there, did you notice any sort of misgivings from my male colleagues about my competence or doubts about my, my competence? I don't know whether it's because I had worked with them or in the area for, for a long time, but uh, I've always said, I, I, if, it, if they were thinking that, then they didn't show me. I didn't feel ostracized. I didn't feel um, uh, any uh, kind of uh, demeanor uh, that uh, implied that I was any less uh, productive or less qualified than my male counterparts. But I can tell you this, and I've always said it, any work situation where men, your male colleagues, doubt your competence, uh, they will press some buttons just to check that you are indeed a solid person. And once they do that and they succeed, you will have a problem. doesn't matter whether it's in broadcasting, whether it's in the public service, uh, in politics it's even worse. Uh, you just have to keep your toes, keep keep everything, you know, you must inform yourself, you must, when you speak, be articulate, research about every subject that you are going to speak about, sound uh, authoritative and in control of the situation, then you'll be okay. I can tell you that I, I am sure... Uh, that uh, some, but I made sure that I didn't give them the the chance. My conviction is that women are necessary. They are very necessary in every field you can think of. In parliament and councils and politics generally, they are very important. It's crucial to have women. I've always said, if you are not in politics, and you are not in a position where you can help in decision making, then there will be a problem. I think we we are all we, we are all needed. We are all intelligent. There's a lot of intelligent women, very articulate women in this country. There's no reason why they shouldn't be there at the decision making table with their male counterpart. Whatsoever. If I doubted their competence, I would have said so. But I don't think we are. I think women in this country are quite intelligent and can do the job. In any case, look, we make, uh, what, 50% of the population? Why should 50% of the population be led by uh, 40% or something of the population? No, it's not right. And you know when you make laws, you must uh, be there where the laws are made. Because if you are not there, those laws are not going to be favorable to your folk. But I still remember my days and those days when we used to argue about why should we have uh, uh, these kinds of assistant policies, assistance policies, which are geared mainly towards men because it's only or mostly men in those days who were cattle farmers and they were all cattle oriented. And we said, look, there are women in the chicken uh, industry. Why can't we have others which are geared towards this? And every step of the way, uh, that is necessary. I still remember uh, when we argued in parliament 
about having gender neutral laws you know he or she him or her that this should be included in the laws of this country because there are men and women who make up the population and the argument then from the old lawyers of the days was no in law he also stands for she and we argued until uh, we want the case right now our laws are gender sensitive and uh, if you look at them you see he or she uh, it makes a lot of difference you may think it's a necessary or minor situation but it's not not to our women men did treat me to a large extent as as a, as an as an equal in politics how you deliver your whatever you if it is a de, in a debate in parliament and you have researched and you really ooze intelligence yeah, everybody will respect you they will notice very early in life early early stages that you have not researched you are um, supporting what you have heard before you don't do your homework it becomes very obvious and of course when it comes to women the 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 the, the saying will be or the conclusion will they will be women are not making an impact they will not say manasha is not making an impact they will say women are not so whatever we do actually as women we must always remember that we are role models people won't tell you directly but i know i have sensed and i have gone through situations which told me that um kana you know when you aspire for something big something senior something i mean i've never really hidden my my aspirations for one day becoming a president what's wrong with that and i used to say well, what is the problem is there a problem uh, you see so when you are like that people especially and you are a woman people will very soon say ah this woman uh, is orata maemo ka swana is really looking for always looking for positions always looking for uh, leadership roles always the question is why not if you think you are qualified and uh, you can do the job what is the problem so i think many people think uh, that, uh, that like i said in my book can demo said you but what does this woman really want and at my uh, mature age these days i'm sure they say what does this old woman still want i don't want anything i just want to be part of the uh, population of this country an active member of society uh, offer ideas where i can because uh, in fact some of the political uh, situations that have taken place lately like in the united states and uh, even in the uk i've seen that here in botswana i think we are losing a lot of uh, quality people simply because you are 60 years old you have to retire you know like i used to say you may have retired but you are not retarded if you are still intelligent enough your brain is working properly and you can give advice and you can contribute in whatever fashion you are not old if people are at 80 something years old can still uh, <laughs> become presidents of a even more powerful country or, or, or five years older than me that means that uh, we are wasting manpower and i know a lot of people out there party or no party just people who can offer a lot but i kept in the back banner in the waste bins simply because they are thought to be old 
we should rethink this situation. Of course, there are stereotypes, and you meet them as you go along. Some of them have not really applied to me, but let me just give you some of them. If you are a woman, you come from Ramotswa, and you marry somebody in Saroe, a man in Saroe, and you want to run for political office there as a member of parliament, people start to remember that you are not one of them. You are from Ramutwa, you are not a Mwatu woman, so why would you stand for political office here? And they will query and question that publicly because to them, they don't understand. We should educate our people about these things. There are stereotypes which are hindering, it may not be that many cases, but they are hindering women. If you are, and uh, I know that uh, at one point in our cabinet under Remohai, there was a time, I'm sure, Bom Mavens, and you will remember this, Bom Memma, as I will remember this, that it was called a cabinet of divorcees. If you divorce, and you are a woman, they try to stigmatize. A divorcee is not any less intelligent, not at all. Uh, and they don't care why and how, they just say, uh, this one is a divorcee, so what? But it doesn't appear to matter in the case of men. We have worked with lots of divorcee men in politics, but it has never been an issue. When it comes to women, it's an issue. The other day we had a, a little workshop or discussion panel with young women. They were telling us that there is also stigmatization uh, against young women. She's not married. She's not married, uh, so she can't run for this office. Why? Where does it come where does it come from? And uh, is it a qualification that before you run for office, you have to be married? I was hearing it for the first time and I was shocked. Uh, me, it looks like it's an issue uh, amongst young women. These things are stereotypes which we should fight against. Speak out against them until such time that people begin to realize that if you are useful and you are a married woman in a village which is not your village, you don't become less useful. I, I want to believe that I delivered when I was even a cabinet minister. I delivered when I was minister of a, a local government for those many years. I, I delivered a lot and uh, of major, major importance to us women is that whatever you do, you are a role model to the ones coming behind. There's a lot of fear out there of being involved in politics because people think that politics is a dirty game and that women should not be involved in it. Of course it's dirty. I must tell the truth. It is dirty. Simply because people will call you names they will describe your looks. They will look at the way you dress. They will <clears throat> research and look at your background. What did she do when she was 18 years old, blah, blah. It doesn't happen to men. We must be aware of these things. And uh, uh, so everything you do, my belief is that the young girls, young ladies behind us, are learning something from us. And uh, that's something. That's something to be proud of. And we should be willing to mentor them. If they ask and approach you, uh, or you even, even if you're not approached and you see something developing and you think you can be of, of, of use and help them, maybe put them together, talk to them about politics and what to look out for, what to prepare for, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, 
Um, there's a lot of viciousness in politics. Uh, that's the truth. So we must always be ready. And things do happen to women that do not happen to men. You know, um, you find somebody's career in politics being cut short uh, for whatever reason. It, it pains me sometimes to see that a young, upcoming, bright, brilliant uh, woman uh, making it in politics, good quality, being thrown out uh, for reasons that uh, uh, we will never, ever get to know. Sometimes I think it's better uh, to fight or um, offer your ideas from inside than from outside. If you are outside as a consultant and you are not active in politics, let me explain this. Being active in politics does not mean necessarily mean addressing rallies and Mangotai and all those areas. No, you can be active in your own way. Offer ideas, write up policies, advice, and so on and so forth uh, while you are. But let me tell you the truth. It's not very easy, you know, to retire completely. Uh, from politics. I think it's fair to say, to some extent, or let me say to a large extent, politics is addictive. You know, once you get in there, it's not easy to just walk away. Especially if you, your brain is still working properly, it's not easy to simply say, no, now I'm leaving, and then you go to the cattle post. To do what? To gather dust there and die? No. Be active. Offer your ideas. Write if you have to write columns in the papers. You know, whatever you can do to make your voice heard in certain areas, go ahead and do that. But don't go there and rot. You can't be passive and sit down and, and, and see things. You see, when you are a politician, you, you see things happening. You see them coming. They come to pass. It's difficult to keep quiet about those kinds of things. You are like um, fine wine when you are mature and old. You are like fine wine is the best when it is oh, mature. You have institutional memory. There's a lot you can impart uh, to your, your, your people, the up and coming politicians. You are there. I believe in retiring into a new role of an advisor. The only thing I can say to the young people who want to join politics is what I have already said. If you are looking for a clean job, politics is not the way to go. It's, uh, there's a lot of things there which happen. Uh, there's a lot of uh, um, underground currents which, uh, if you are not looking carefully, you may not see. Uh, but um, supposing we were all to say as women, politics is dirty, politics is vicious, I'm not going there, who would? Then it will be a parliament made 100% men, council made up 100% men, huh? and uh, I think it will be irresponsible uh, of us, really. We must play our role as a 50% uh, of the population. So <clears throat> my only advice is that go in there. We are here. We can assist where possible. Uh, you can't just say, no, it is not my area. People will ask you, like they have asked most of us, or how do you manage? How do you manage all this, you know, being insulted, blah, blah. 
Uh, no, you, you have to manage. How come they manage? Huh? They also manage, so let's also manage. That is my position.